So there are three things that an NFL team needs to have in order to win in the playoffs. For one, you need a defense, obviously. You need a ball control offense that can really mount a long drive and control the pace of a game if you need to. And you need an explosive offense that can score quickly and get back into a game if you need to. When it comes to the Ravens, they have pretty much all of that. The defense, admittedly, has been kind of hit or miss, but I attribute that more to injuries and COVID than just downright lack of talent or execution, and they are starting to get healthier as we inch towards January, so I kind of think that's going to work itself out, and in the end, they'll be fine. And then on offense, believe it or not, their ball control offense and their quick scoring explosive offense both come from the same thing, their run game. There's this narrative out there that the Ravens aren't good enough or explosive enough to keep up with Kansas City or Buffalo or any of the other AFC powerhouses if they try to make it a shootout. But truth be told, even without a consistent passing game, the Ravens still have one of the most efficient and one of the most explosive offenses in the entire league because of how well they run the ball. In terms of points per game, they are 8th in the league at 28.7. In terms of yards per point, which is a good measure of how efficient they are at getting points out of their possessions and not just getting a bunch of empty yards without scoring, they are ranked 1st in the NFL at 12.3 yards per point. In terms of points per play, which again measures efficiency, they are 4th at 0 0.47. And in terms of explosive plays generated, meaning how many plays, either rushing or passing, that they've gotten of 20 yards or more, they are still 8th in the league at 63, which is tied with Cleveland, who also has a great offense, and Baltimore is even higher in that category than a lot of other offenses that are generally seen as explosive, like the Titans, Chargers, and Seahawks. Hell, they are only three explosive plays behind the Packers, who have arguably been the best offense in the league this year, so believe it or not, the big plays have been there for the Ravens this season. It certainly doesn't look pretty all the time, and it's definitely not conventional, but the Ravens offense is statistically amazing because their run game is amazing. So with my Maryland mule in hand and my Mile High Miracle hoodie on my body that I designed myself, shameless plug, you can get that at the link on the screen or down in the pinned comment below. Let's dive into this Greg Roman offense and really examine what makes it tick. There are more little wrinkles to this playbook than I could possibly break down in just a single episode, so I'm not even going to try to do that because we'll be here all day. But for our purposes of just giving a high level introduction to how this system works, I want to focus on the two main pillars of this run game that have made it so effective in 2020. Number one, they have a heavy reliance on any type of run that involves a pulling blocker getting to the front side meaning the power run game, the sway run game, which other coaches just call long trap. There's the wrap run game, which is pretty much just sway, but to the weak side. They run a whole bunch of different types of counters as well. In particular, GT windback counter seems to be one of their favorites. And to most people, these all kind of look the same on first glance because they all involve pulling blockers of some kind, even if the landmarks and the assignments and the techniques and the angles are all somewhat different. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to lump all of them together into one category because they all use the same philosophy at the end of the day of getting a numbers advantage at the point of attack with those extra blockers. And then the second main pillar of this run game that kind of works off the power run game is a change up per se. They actually do quite the opposite and work away from the pulling blockers where they do not have a numbers advantage. And that is called the QB counter bash play call series. Counter bash is the knockout punch, I guess you could say, for this offense. The finisher, the explosive gain producer. Greg Roman calls it 16 or 17 flow in his playbook for reference, but most people just call it QB counter bash, so that's what I will call it as well. All of these concepts are woven together by Roman perfectly, play after play, series after series, game after game, more than anything else in his playbook. So understanding these two philosophies, either running with the pullers or running against them, is the first step to understanding how the Ravens offense operates. Let's start with power, which is the bedrock play that this entire system is built upon. The Ravens run a lot of different types of power runs. There's regular old power with a kickout block from the fullback on the edge defender and the guard pulling up inside as the lead blocker. That's kind of the defining characteristic of power, the guard leading inside and the kickout block from that fullback outside. 
They also run what they call Power King, which is the same play, but from 22 personnel. So you've got a fullback and two tight ends. There's also Power Bonus, which is when the move tight end or the H-back is the one kicking out instead of the fullback, and the fullback is just a lead blocker inside instead. There's a single back power play that they call Punch, and that's just power, but without a fullback at all. I mean, I could go on and on and on here, but suffice to say, they've got a million different variations of the same concept, and they all look mostly the same, but slightly different. And that's before we even get to Sway and Wrap and Counter and all of their variations as well. But the goal with all of these runs, power or otherwise, is the same get a numbers advantage using pulling blockers to the play side so that you can get a hat on a hat and create a lane for the running back. They call power runs God's play for a reason, because it works, and it's always worked since the beginning of the sport. But Greg Roman has taken this century-old concept and supercharged it more than any other team in the league. I think my favorite variation of power that they run is called Power Z Guide, which they ran several times a few weeks ago against the Browns, and the reason why I love it so much is that it uses motion at the snap to almost surprise the defense with a free kickout block with that receiver running at full speed. And that's a fantastic way to get that numbers advantage to the play side on a power run before the defense can adjust and rotate down to match those new numbers. From the end zone angle here, you can really see how the numbers change on this play for the defense in real time. Before Willie Sneed comes in motion from off screen to the left, the Browns theoretically have the numbers to the play side to get a free fitter in there to stop a normal power run. You've got the Mike backer, the Sam backer, the play side three technique, the play side defensive end, and both the free safety that can fill the alley from deep and another cornerback that's slightly off screen to the right. So that's six defenders that can easily get there against four play side blockers for the Ravens plus a pulling guard makes five. So that's five blockers on six defenders. That's good math for the defense. But when you bring Sneed in motion, now you're getting a six blocker to the play side to match the numbers of the defense, and the defense can't respond in time to bring a seventh guy over there to make them plus one in the run fit again because the ball is being snapped immediately and they don't have an opportunity to adjust. You've got a down block from the center to seal out the nose tackle, a good double team on the three technique, another double team on the end that works its way up to the Mike linebacker, and then the two pullers, Sneed and Bradley Bozeman, are each hitting their targets too. And that all happens in the blink of an eye before the defense can adjust. Bozeman is responsible for the first guy he sees outside the play side double team, and Sneed is responsible for the second guy outside. Both of their blocks obviously connect, so J.K. Dobbins cuts off Bozeman's inside hip since he's got leverage there, and the only free defender left to get into that hole, the Will linebacker, is late to get over there and fill it because he had to respect the possibility of Lamar Jackson just keeping it to the backside, which Lamar was never going to do. The Will linebacker was in a no-win situation here, and honestly, I don't think there's anything he could do about it. This variation of power, again called Power Z Guide, is a nightmare to defend against because it's really hard to get that coveted numbers advantage on defense without any time to adjust to that motion before the ball is snapped. This play forces defenses to be perfect and get off blocks to make tackles in space, or die trying, and let's be honest, when your running backs are J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards, most of the time they're gonna die trying. But the misery for defenses doesn't stop there, because once teams start to get used to power and sway and rap and GT counter and how to fit against all of these runs that bring one, two, sometimes even three extra lead blockers to the front side, that's when Greg Roman tends to call that changeup, either QB counter bash or bash sweep with the running back, to get an explosive gain. Before we get into that play design though, because I promise there's a lot of meat on that bone that we gotta go through, I do want to take a moment to thank this week's sponsor, Hawthorne. Hawthorne is a premium men's tailored grooming brand that is making it easier for guys to look, smell, and feel their best. All you have to do is take a quick quiz online at Hawthorne's website where they ask you questions on everything from your type of skin, to your type of hair, to your favorite fragrance, and of course your favorite drink, and they'll come up with a personalized list of products from their catalog that fits your needs, and from there you can pick which ones you want and which ones you don't. 
Personally, I love everything that I got in my own tailored list, especially this time of year. This face lotion is super clutch because Southern California winters, if you don't know, if you don't live here, are super dry. It's like 8% humidity while I filmed this today, so my face and hands feel like death. But this face lotion really, really helps out. Uh, it's not super greasy either, like some lower quality lotions are. It doesn't make me look all shiny. It's just a really high quality lotion that hydrates and just makes my skin feel better in our very, very dry winters. If you take the quiz yourself and you decide there are some products you wanna try, Hawthorne takes out all the risk because you get free shipping on your order and on any returns. And if you don't even like your products, they'll retailer them for you based on your feedback. I definitely think you guys should give Hawthorne a shot. They're really great products. And if you go through their catalog and you see anything you like, you can get an extra 10% off your first order with promo code FILMROOM10. Again, that is promo code FILMROOM10 for an extra 10% off your first order at the link in the description below. That is hawthorne.co. Again, thank you to Hawthorne for sponsoring this week's show. I really, really appreciate it. And with that being said, let's move on to perhaps the hottest run play in the NFL this season that's ripping defenses up week after week, QB counter bash. Bash, as some coaches call it, stands for back away, as in the running back is flowing away from the pulling blockers this time and not with them. And while that may seem counterintuitive on paper because you're giving up that numbers advantage that we just talked about, the pulling blockers are not actually for the running back, but rather the quarterback. That's why it's called QB counter. Again, this is a way to use pullers to even up the numbers on the play side for the ball carrier and get a hat on a hat and open up a lane, but just for a different ball carrier this time, which is Lamar Jackson. Meanwhile, on the back side where the running back is flowing to, the defensive end on that side will be left completely unblocked so that he can just get up the field and go after that running back as a decoy. Now, while some might call this a read play because there is an unblocked defender, and yes, most other offenses that do run this run it as a read play, the Ravens do it differently than everyone else. Lamar is not actually reading the unblocked defensive end on these bash calls, and you can watch his eyes and his footwork here on this example against the Browns to confirm that. He's not reading Olivier Vernon for a give key or a keep key. He's holding onto that ball no matter what because the keep was a predetermined call based on Greg Roman's feel and intuition for how the defense will play against it. If Roman thinks the end is going to shoot up the field and take away the running back, he'll call for Lamar to keep it and follow the pulling blockers to the front side. If he thinks the end will take Lamar away by crashing inside, he'll call for the back to get it on the sweep so that he can outflank the defense and get the edge for free. It's all about what Roman sees happening on the field so that he can make better informed play calls as the game progresses, especially in the run game. That's why he calls plays from up in the booth in the first place so that he can actually see what's happening. That is typically how this play will work when Jackson gets the keeper. But when you look at a variation of this call from the Dallas game earlier in the season, on that play, Roman knew that the defensive end would just stay square and take a couple steps inside so that he could crash down on Lamar. So Roman called for Jackson to give the ball to Dobbins on the sweep instead, who promptly got that edge for free and ripped off a huge gain. These two plays look basically the same, and it does look like a read in real time from Lamar. But as I said, it's really not. It's all educated guesses from Roman to call the right play at the right time, and more often than not, he will make the right call. Plus, even on rare occasion, if he doesn't get it right, and Lamar sees something before the snap in his opponent's alignment or stance that is a red flag, Jackson can always change the play to either the keep or the give if he needs to at the line of scrimmage, and Roman trusts him to do so. I think my favorite example of how Roman adjusts his calls on these bash looks came in that same Browns game in the second half. On a critical third down, when third string quarterback Trace McSorley was in the game while Lamar was still in the locker room, Roman dialed up that QB counter bash to try to move the chains, as he does virtually every other week on third downs or in other key situations like short yardage where he needs a very high percentage play. It's been kind of his go-to call this season in do or die situations. Now, I want you to watch closely what happens here with Miles Garrett, the unblocked defensive end. As soon as Garrett sees the left tackle pull, he immediately knows it's QB counter bash because they run it all the time. So he immediately stops getting upfield, he squares himself up and starts to read the mesh point. 
Now, from this position, could Garrett still maybe have restarted his momentum and gotten Edwards down in the backfield if it was a give on the sweep? I mean, yeah, it's possible. He's Miles Garrett. He's a freak of nature. But the key takeaway here is that he was not playing the running back all the way. He was splitting the difference so that he could play the running back and the quarterback too. And that proved to be the correct decision. McSorley kept it. Olivier Vernon did a really nice job plugging up the play on the front side so that Trace had nowhere to go. And he got tackled for a loss by Garrett from the backside, unfortunately tearing up his knee in the process on kind of a freak accident. Now, Lamar came back in the game one play later on that famous fourth down and threw that big touchdown that we all remember to Hollywood, and that was pretty insane, obviously. But do you know what happened right after that score? Just two plays after Garrett made that tackle for loss on McSorley that set up that fourth down in the first place? On the two-point conversion attempt resulting from that touchdown, Roman called that bash play again since he just saw how the defensive ends were playing it before. But this time, he called for Dobbins to get the ball on the sweep, not Lamar on the keeper. He knew the defensive ends were going to crash inside to go after the threat of the QB counter, because that's what they just did. So Dobbins would have a great angle to get to the edge, with Gus Edwards as an extra lead blocker, of course, since they ran this concept out of two back instead of single back. And all Dobbins had to do after he outflanked the defense was just lower his shoulder and beat the one safety to punch it in, which of course he did. This was a tremendous play call and a great moment from Roman specifically that speaks to his ability to be both streamlined and chaotic at the same time. Streamlined, of course, because they kind of run the same four concepts over and over again, but chaotic because even though they are running the same concepts over and over, they're always tweaking or changing one little thing here or there, whether it's formation or personnel or motion, just tiny little things that make the plays look wildly different even though they're not, and defenses are constantly guessing wrong as a result. I'll use that Jacksonville game following the win over the Browns as an example. They ran that regular QB counter bash call on a third and three, and of course got a big play out of it like they almost always do in short yardage situations. And then two plays later, they showed that exact same pre-snap motion with Dobbins and Edwards both on the field that they just showed against Cleveland on the two point conversion kind of making it look like they were going to be running that same sweep, except it wasn't even a run at all this time, and they ran four verts out of it from 21 personnel, mind you, which is insane. I mean, you almost never see that. It's extremely rare, and yet they got a huge gain out of it. And then on the very next play, after they got inside the five-yard line with that pass, they called QB counter bash again, except they didn't do the GT version of it with both pullers from the backside like they normally do, and they pulled both guards instead. So they had a little bit better angles to the edge to make sure that Lamar could punch it in. Again, it's the same play that they've always run, but just ever so slightly different, or at least just different enough so that the defense gets caught off guard and doesn't know how to handle it. And that's what I love about this offense. Greg Roman doesn't give a single shit. He knows he's calling the same four plays. The defense knows he's calling the same four plays. But all of the window dressing and the slight variation added in with all of their speed in the backfield, it just makes defenses panic and they don't know what to do. Even the Steelers couldn't handle it, and they were arguably the best run defense in the league before all of their injuries piled up. This Ravens offense is deadly, and whether you want to believe in some narrative about how they aren't consistent or explosive or they can't keep up on a track meet, blah, 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 they're good. They're really good. And if and when they beat Cincinnati this weekend, and if they can get a little bit healthier because their injury report reads like a fucking CVS receipt right now, they can be a legitimate championship contender. They have all three ingredients to be a good playoff team. They play defense when they're healthy, they can run the ball really well and kill clock if they need to, and they can generate explosive plays and get into a shootout if they need to. They can do all of that. I know that they're not being taken seriously right now because they've had some rough losses against some other good teams, and on some level I guess I can understand that. But at the same time, historically speaking, they've always been a more dangerous team when they're underestimated anyway. So in a way, that's kind of a good thing for them. Underestimate them at your own peril, because if this team gets into the postseason with that quarterback and that run game and that defense, if they're healthy, and that coaching staff and that kicker, I guess you could even say, because Justin Tucker's the GOAT, they can beat anybody. And I mean anybody. 
Yes, that means you too, Kansas City. If you don't believe me, come back tomorrow because I'm going to be dropping yet another episode breaking down that so-called unbeatable Chiefs team. Believe it or not, Kansas City, even though I do believe that they are the best team in the league right now, so this is not coming from a place of salt, but rather a place of concern, even that juggernaut of a team has a very obscure, but also very important weakness that they are going to have to address if they want to make it out of the playoffs alive. And trust me, it's really, really weird. So I'm going to be back here tomorrow to break all of that down. I hope you'll join me. And until then, cheers. Thank <laughs> you.